how uh, does it work, what form factors it comes, you know, all of that. So any questions before I start? Good, okay. All right, so um, I, uh, some of you might be from a firewall background, right? Some of you might not, but uh, we'll, we'll go in, in that level where, right, a uh, non-firewall background, I can understand what, what you're talking about, right? So sometimes we'll be uh, talking about basic things, so right, uh, take it lightly. So, um, right, so the- Sir, to, to, sir uh, today's first class, no? Correct. Okay, sir. All right, so today is the, uh, the first class. We're kicking it off from today, right? Um, and the timing would be the same, right? Nine, ideally 1.5 hours, right? Sometimes it might take two, uh, right? Depending on topic, right? Sometimes it might even uh, get, get um, done with even faster, depending on the topic, right? And it's a weekday uh, session as such. All right, perfect. Okay. So um, let's get started, right? So um, we'll, we'll try to understand, right? What is um, the, what are the functional components of a PA firewall, right? Little bit of hardware we have, we have to learn uh, to understand what are these advanced functionalities that Palo Alto is offering, right? So a little bit of theory is needed to understand uh, a little package flow, right? So uh, the topic that I want to talk, take today is uh, something called as the life of a packet. So give you a brief idea on what happens, right, internally in the firewall, right, when a packet is going through, right, from from the start to the end to, until it is transmitted out, right. So let me go ahead and share my screen. All right. So. Uh, Okay. Okay. So, right, uh, the PA firewall, right? Okay. So uh, to understand about Palo, right? Um, they come in two variants, right? One is a VM or a virtual machine, right? That means they give you an ISO or a KVM, right? A queued out to image file. And you can deploy this as a virtual firewall in any virtual environments, right? For example, you can host it on cloud solutions like AWS, right? Azure, um, GCP, right, Google Cloud or your own on-prem, right, uh, solutions, VMware, right, or KVM instance, right. Any virtualization hypervisor setup, right, uh, you can uh, deploy this, right, and make it, um, right, get the get most of the functionalities, right, uh, most, right. There are some uh, hidden things that you don't get when you use a VM. But the good part about VM is the hardware, is owned by you right? the company or the customer owns the hardware right so there is no hardware cost involved only the licensing is what you need right so you can buy uh, the licenses what you require right from palo alto and then get started with it and um, the hardware is maintained by you right you have to uh, give a dedicated um, um, cpu i mean multiple virtual cpu cores rams allocated to this vm right um, and uh, the underlying hardware is yours and you have to take care of it, right? Anything happens to that hardware, right? You need to replace it, right? No no RMA support. Um, hey, uh, is how is my audio, guys? Is there an audio problem? It's good for me. Oh, it's good. It's good. It's good. Yeah, okay, okay, cool. Perfect. So, um, Whereas, right, so that's that's about the VM, right? So it's cost effective a little bit, right? To be honest, it's not that cost effective as well, right? Um, why? Because uh, Palo Alto does not charge a lot for a hardware, right? When you buy a physical hardware, the cost is not for the hardware really, right? The major cost is in the licensing fees, right? For a subscription, which is uh, like a um, subscription model, right? So every year you can you need to renew it, right? So that is where they make the money, right? 
Um, but the good factor is people are moving to cloud, right? Everything is moving to cloud, right? More reliability, more secure, right? More stable, right? Uh, when you rather than hosting on on prem, so right that's why VMs are mo most commonly seen. All right, so uh, all right, yeah. I mean, um, uh, I just got a question. So uh, yeah, we'll be talking about the firewall, right? I'm just giving to uh, understanding about Palo Alto, um, how they offer this firewall, right? We will talk about what. A firewall is right. Uh, what are the actual function that it does, and how does it specifically work on Palo Alto? Right. And we'll be going into it. I'm just talking about the vendor as such. Right. How Palo Alto is giving you different options to buy their services. Right. Okay. So right, VM is the right one of the uh, options that you can go for, or you can go for a physical model. That means, right. Um. Did I mean? Okay. So um, what a physical model is right you have to buy a box right similar to you you buying a switch or a router from cisco right same uh you you buy a firewall right it comes in or different variants right uh so depending on um your uh, business use case right you might require it for a small branch office you might need it for a um a, a small location hub location where you have like let's say 100 users or it might be for a headquarters or a data center right so uh the the firewall has to be sized that means let's say i have a branch office with 10 employees right this is only 10 employees sitting in an office right a small box would be more than enough right a pa220 right this is a hardware model this is more than enough for a branch with 10 users there. Why? Because there are not much users and there is not much traffic that is going to go through this firewall. Whereas, let's say in my HQ, I have, let's say, 1,000 users sitting, right? 1,000 users are there and there are multiple, let's say, 100 servers also, right? Which are connected to internet, right? Cloud services, all of that. So here, I need lot of capacity on my firewall my firewall should be able to handle multiple number of sessions right concurrently right the load on the firewall will be high let's say here uh, the maximum session was only let's say 5000 right per second right 5000 connections right we call it a cps connections per second so it's only 5000 for a small branch let's say with 10 users whereas in this case it might be 2 million right so depending on those number of concurrent sessions right um you can buy uh when you decide to um, buy palo alto you need to make uh the sales team helps with that to uh, take an informed decision on what device you need so when you buy a pa right they sell these numbers which is throughput numbers that means each model of the firewall has different speed right for the port right so let's say 220 has one gigabit port right that means there is a ethernet port that can support up to one gb per second right whereas in a, a home um, hq you need more bandwidth right you have let's say a 10 gig isp line right 10 gb is your internet speed so this small firewall is not going to cut it you need a firewall which is capable and trans is able to transmit a bulk of right data right there the uh, the port speed should not become a bottleneck so in higher models you will see right um one gig port 10 gig port right 10 gig sfp right um people who don't know sfp small form pluggable this is the optical fiber cable right where you plug in a transceiver right and you use optical fiber cables for this connection so SFP plus modules, right, uh, which can up, sub, uh, support up to 10 gig. There is QSFP plus modules, which can support up to 40 gig, right? So um, higher the ladder, right? More, inter the number of interfaces will go up. The speed of the interfaces will be better, right? So more throughput numbers, right, on the port side. Similarly, they also, right advertise the capability right they say that hey this firewall can take or give you a throughput 
of let's say 10 gbps right of vpn traffic that means at a given second it can handle 10 gigabytes of vpn traffic so this is a good firewall for keeping as a vpn endpoint to um and basically give your users remote workers right to connect to the vpn and work right this is a good firewall right yeah Debrut, go ahead yes actually suppose if mm -hmm. i only use uh, pa220 then how many concurrent call will be support how many i mean concurrent call will be support no, you mean concurrent sessions is it yeah, concurrent session. Sorry. Concurrent. Yeah. So uh, the concurrent sessions part, right? I mean, I don't have the right number right now. Uh, uh -huh. There is a command. I'll show you that how you can find that from the firewall CLI. Also, there are uh, public documents. You can just search PA220 Palo Alto data sheet, right? Okay. You'll get the PDF and those numbers are listed there, right? That would be or uh, not 100 percent uh approximate okay. they always okay. they always limit or be, let's say right if the firewall can handle 120 sessions they will only advertise 100 right a little bit low only they will advertise in the portal but the actual numbers you can see on the cli which i'll show you okay right so it, it, and, it varies so, uh depending on what model it is right it, it will uh vary okay and one more thing you have uh, the in starting, you are saying VM and as well as physical device. Suppose if I'll go with the VM, then how will it calculate the, what will be the hardware configuration required for the, I mean, suppose someone saying ki, eh, we have a setup for the 200 resource. Okay. Mm -hmm. Then uh, how will, if I will go with the VM, then how uh, how will it calculate the, I mean, the hardware configuration will be required for this one? Sure. So for that, VM comes with the different licensing models. So based okay. on these numbers that you're uh, talking about, right? The number of transactions, all of that. Right. So right. Uh, there are models like PM50, 100, right? PM300, 700, 500, 700, right? Models. So mm -hmm. you need to buy a license like this first, right? Mm -hmm. And so let's say I your business use case needs, let's say 2 million sessions per second capability. So let's say they are selling you VM300. So okay. they will tell you that, hey, right, this is the uh, price for the VM300 subscription. You pay that, you get the subscription. And they tell you hey, to this VM should have, let's say, uh, 32 mm -hmm. gigs of RAM. Mm -hmm. And it, it needs, let's say, 120 or sorry, uh, uh, 16 cores of CPU. Okay. Right. So this number will change based on what type of VM model license you purchase. Right. So the catch is that. Hmm. When you try to license a firewall with be very basic uh, capability, let's say you have 8 GB RAM and mm -hmm. you have two CPUs allocated and you try to use a VM300 uh, uh, license on it, it will give you an error mm -hmm. stating that VM300 requires right whatever is the requirement, this much CPU and this much core. So you need to allocate that much hardware resources to the VM, restart it, and then only you can apply that license. Okay. Right. So more, more throughput or uh, sorry, more capability, more number of sessions, the more resources you need to allocate it. It's your responsibility because it's a VM. Mm -hmm. okay? okay. All right. All right. So, uh, so th that's, that's uh, the good part about physical is that, right? It's a little bit more uh, reliable, right? A lot of firewalls does not um, have uh, been reported to have a lot of hardware issues as such, right? It's very rare. And if you get uh, a hard, get into an hard, hardware issue, right? They do an RMA, right? That means they replace the right. device for you. Replace, right? uh, uh, so that is there, right? It can be a, a power cable, a, PA, a power module. It can be uh, any damage, right? A SSD uh, gone, uh, anything, right? Anything associated with the firewall, they'll change it, right? And depending uh, on what type of subscription you have, the speed uh, of that also will differ, right? Um, uh, the most, uh, the speedy time of delivery is the one that you get delivered under four hours, right? There is an uh, offering like that. Uh, uh, so if you have a support contract like that from Palo Alto, you, you get the replacement under four hours, right? Express right. delivery from the nearest hub, right? right? So that's that's about um, the the physical part, right? So we'll be talking about different models, right? Uh, going forward, we'll be talking about that. Mm -hmm. But yeah, this is about the vendor, right? So uh -huh. you know, right, in the firewall, right, industry right now, PA, right, 
is the number one or leader there, right? Just followed by Fortinet, right? right? So hmm. PA is costly, right? And it is very effective. Whereas Fortinet is cheap compared to Palo Alto, right? Uh, they have some plus points in terms of SSL decryption and all, right? The uh, the the uh, every vendor of the firewall use something known as ASIC. Anyone heard of this term? ASIC. Oh, nobody. Uh, nothing. Oh, that's bad. Is that a certificate authority? No, 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 no. Yeah, it's a, it's a electronic term, right? It's an, uh, so ASIC stands for Application Specific Integrated Circuit, right? ASIC is nothing but a chip, right? A chip that Samsung or multiple vendors created, right? This ASIC. It's a chip that you can program to do different functions, right? So for threat analysis, you can make, you can program the chip to do whatever you want, right? It depends on your programming skill. So um, Fortinet is right, a little bit advanced in terms of SSL handling uh, because of, they have made some ASIC chips dedicated for decryption, uh, uh, more into hardware acceleration part and all, which we'll talk about, right? But yeah, the, the leader here in, in uh, firewall sector, right, currently is Palo followed by Fortinet, right? And then you can right take other uh, vendors, right? Checkpoint, um, uh, uh, Juniper, SRX, right? Or um, you can go with um, Cisco FTV, right? All of that. But yeah, these these are the two prominent, right, uh, folks who are leading the industry in in in, in terms of uh, the network security domain, right? Why? Because a lot of innovation, a lot of things that they're coming in, and their threat research is really good, right? Okay. Now, um, let's, let's talk about a little bit, right, um, on the firewall as such, right? So, right, people who don't know, right, what is the difference between a router and a firewall, right? So, see, router is an L3 device, right, layer 3, right? It works on what? Network layer, right? So, it looks into what header, IP header. So, the only job right of a router is what to look at the destination ip right when a packet is received on an interface it looks into the destination ip right and does a route lookup and finds the exit interface and sends it out right so to route the packet right apart from that you can apply a little bit of access control which is nothing but an acl so you can write create rules or write access list which tells you or tells the router to allow or deny some traffic right and this ecls are all maximum has a view or visibility up to layer 4 that means it can write typical your extended ecls what you talk about right an access list can handle up to what and i it can um block or allow traffic based on ip port number protocol number right uh anything else ip protocol ip protocol and port right this is so this is only l4 information up to l4 only right it is able to look right it cannot block um google.com or facebook.com right but because you cannot identify with Facebook or Google based on these three info, right? It's not possible. That is only there in the upper layers, right? So the job of a standard router is to route packets, right? And apply basic access list, right? Or access control, right? Now, then came the firewalls, right? You you have the ASA firewall, right? The legacy firewalls, right? Uh, which was stateful. Right, that means it had a session table. Right, stateful means it maintains a session table. It is session aware. That means, right, if a, a client behind the firewall is trying to access something, right, in the internet, right, let's say this is Google, right, and you're trying to access Google, so you send a request, right, a TCP send packet, you're sending it out. So a reply will come from the server, right? 
sin plus ac. This packet does not need a policy back, right? Typically, right, let's say um, in this code term, right, you call it inside to outside, right? I mean, these own namings as such. So you would have a policy allowing from inside to outside, but for this return traffic, you don't need a policy from outside to inside. Why? Because there is a session. So the firewall is intelligent enough to understand that, okay, this is a reply to a packet that we have sent. Uh, it is part of an existing session that is live, right? And it will allow it implicitly, right? That, that is what a session table is used for, right? To be session aware, to ensure that, right, the sessions uh, are tracked, the reply packets are allowed without any kind of blockage, right? All of that. And track a session as well, right? You need to age out a session, all of that. Okay. Then came, right? So the limitation with these firewalls, right? The ESA, right? Again, was that it does not look into a layer seven data, right? Again, it was the same thing. You had all you could do with these firewalls is again, right? Access control, right? You, you could apply, right? Some ACLs, right? So then came the need for the next generation firewall, right? What we call as NGFW, next generation firewalls, right? This basically, right? So the next generation firewall means layer seven inspection. Up to layer seven, we are inspecting. That means, right, whatever data you're sending, we are inspecting the data packets in all upper layers, right? So not just up to the layer 4 TCP or UDP, we can also see what type of data, what is the data that you're sending in, inside the TCP, right, segment, right? So complete layer seven inspection is what an extension firewall offers. And Palo Alto, right, is a NGFW. So that, that being said, when a client behind a firewall, right, uh, as connecting to, let's say, Google, right, through a Palo Alto, right? So every packet, when it enters the firewall, it goes through a, a, a complete process, which we call, right, you can Google this and you can see a KB article from Palo Alto on this, right? It's called a life of packet, which explains what are the different stages, what are the different processes that happens through the firewall from the time it enters it till the time it leaves the firewall, right? The entire firewall processing for every single packet, right? Now, the, um, my quick question for you guys, right? So for every uh, HTTPS connection, right? We use TCP as the right L4 protocol. So is there any kind of application data in, in this TCP packets? TCP three-way handshake, does it uh, contain any kind of uh, application data? Anyone? Yes, uh, I think it carries the HTTPS as a passport and uh, forward the HTML file as a web page. Uh, when no, we no, do... uh, uh, just hear out the question once more. I'm talking about only the initial three packets which is used for the three-way handshake. So that's that SYN packet going out, SYN plus ACK, and then finally ACK. Every DCP connection, right, irrespective of upper layer protocols, does the same thing. Does it contain application data inside it? If you use the um, FTP, if you use... Um, SSH, if you use anything, right, based on TCP, the same three-way handshake. Yes, any, any, FTP. any idea? Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. Yes, FTP. FTP uh, initially uh, established the connection between the source to destination. After the data will be traveled, uh, data no. will be transferred from the source to destination. That I understood. I mean, uh, you're talking about the control and data channel and all. Uh, what I'm talking about here is right. The, TCP three-way handshake, right? You should have a clear understanding of this. This is typically, right, a standard product-based companies and ask this question, right? They they can grill you on TCP handshake alone, right? You should have a very good un understanding of TCP three-way handshake, right? I mean, uh, it's one it's one of the fundamentals, right? It's not about firewall. It's fundamentals of networking actually right? because most of the uh, right complex things are based on tcp right all applications are based so you should know tcp 
to uh, troubleshoot a lot of issues with application latency issues, all of that, right? TCP is a important part, right? So just to give you an understanding, right? So this is the three-way handshake, right? Is, is a protocol used by TCP to establish a connection between a client and server where they are announcing a lot of capabilities, right? So you have multiple six flags there, right? Uh, inside TCP, you have multiple TCP options, right? You have options like SAC, selective acknowledgement, right? You have the MSS size, right? Um, oh, uh, quick question, what is MSS and MTU? Anyone able to explain that? What is the difference between MSS and MTU? Maximum segment size and maximum transmission unit. Oh, okay, important guys, important, very important. This is again, right? Rudimentary things that you should know in networking, right? So just have a go, right? Just take, uh, it hardly will take 10 minutes to just go through some online document. This Google search, right? What is MSS? MSS versus MTU, just read. Right? and have a clear understanding what is a segment what is the uh, right segment size inside tcp right how is it related to mtu right so uh, in basically right i mean M mtu is the num the actual uh, amount of data that uh, is sent on the wire for a packet right so typically right the standard mtu for internet right is 1500 so uh, an ip packet contains maximum up to 1500 bytes of data right additionally in the link local between l2 levels you can see an, an, another 14 bytes right so typically you'll see 1514 right uh, when you capture on a link right so 1500 is the maximum amount of data out of which 20 is used by ip header right rest of the um, 1480 is available for the upper layers right so in tcp what the mss is it's nothing but 1500 the mtu minus ip header minus the tcp header right sorry yeah 20 bytes for ip 20 bytes for tcp header right gives you 1460 right which is the default mss right that a client would negotiate provided that it's an ic the network interface is 1500 bytes right as the mtu size right which is standard right all your systems right would ideally you would see this and un, un, uh, unless it is a legacy device you would see 1460 as an mss or, or this is nothing but tcp is telling that right, i have an mtu of 1500 and i can send a maximum data of 1460 bytes inside my tcp segment right inside my 14 uh, tcp segment i can send 1460 bytes of data above which i need to add 40 bytes of headers for tcp and ip right that is what mss is, is meaning so coming back right so on on the firewall right there are a lot of functionalities um, that it applies to every packet that it goes through so this three way handshake is a no, uh, generic thing that is used to establish every connection and this does not contain any l7 data no it does not contain it is just a connection a handshake a, a connection establishment handshake by tcp which is very generic right it does not contain any information about what is going to come next that means if i send a tcp sin or if i complete a tcp three way handshake on port 443 it does not mean that I'll be using SSL, right? For the packet will be client hello, no. That does not imply that. You could use HTTP on port 443. You could use um, FTP on 443, right? The only thing that you need is your server needs to be configured to listen on that port, right? Which you can very well do. So there are standard ports, and but that does not stop you from using any non-standard port. That is your wish, right? So three-way handshake is a generic connection establishment uh, packet flow where there is no information about what is going to come on the upper layer as a result right this tcp three-way handshake has no l7 data right so typically all vendor firewalls does a basic checks and installs a session based on the handshake but does not send the packet for l7 inspection or we call it as right dpi deep packet inspection no that does not happen for this 
So deep packet inspection or L7 inspection happens to the packets that has an upper layer data, right? L7, uh, layer 7 data that is there. Inside a TCP 3 way handshake, there is no upper layer data, right? Hence, right, there is no need of a upper layer uh, a deep a DPI uh, scope for this packet, right? So the firewall, right, is going to allow it, right, without any uh, uh, ch ch uh, checks happening for uh, say a thread part or um, for um, more uh, for the application identification or the uh, threat identification functions does not apply here. Why? Right? Because you cannot identify it. Why? Right? Because uh, the TCP 3 way handshake does not contain any such information. Right? It's a waste of resource. No. So, quick question. I mean, anyone has a question here at this point? Good. Okay. All right. Now. Let's talk about right the firewall as such, right? So this Palo Alto firewall, right, has a functionality, a feature called App ID, right? You might have heard about this application identification, right? So they advertise that we have layer seven, right, signature based app identification right that means whenever some traffic flow happens through the firewall right they do a layer 7 signature match based application that the application is not in previously right in the yeah melvin go ahead melvin you there uh, yes, yeah. Kevin. I just yeah. wanted to ask you um, in Palo Alto, if we if we learn this uh, system, are you uh, am I able to work on other firewalls also? Is the logic same? True. Yes, ninety nine percent of the firewall vendors use the same logic. The only because difference my, the yeah, the company with where I'm working it's uh, it's Sonic Walls. So I just want to have a more understanding of uh five walls so that's why i'm over here mm -hmm. uh, i just wanted to know if i do this five uh, palo alto will it be helpful for me in any other firewalls sectors all right see the hardware underlying hardware might be different the actual uh, pro logic that they use might be a little different but Technologically, there is only one way of doing things right or one acceptable way of doing things in the industry well, let it you take it for VPN, you take it for SSL decryption, you take it for application or threat identification. Everyone uses the same technology. How they do it might differ, right? Some might use an algorithm proprietary to them, right? Palo Alto uses a pro proprietary algorithm. Similarly, Fortinet uses a different one. Sonic Wall also might use a different one, right? But uh, what you're going to learn, right? SSL inspection or, or remote access VPN, these are common, right? You take any vendor. The same logic, same thing, it's all technology. It's the same thing. The only thing is, uh, in, in Palo Alto, you might call it right, uh, remote access VPN global protect. Sonic Wall might have a different name. Cisco has any connect. Different brandings for the same thing. That's it. But yeah, it would be right 99% similar. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Okay. So, right. Um, App ID or layer seven based inspection, right? All vendors, right, uh, which are next generation firewalls, right? They they offer this, right? So um, how do you differentiate between PA or how do you make a decision between PA or right? How do you say that Fortinet or PA is better, right? There is a team working behind it. These signatures are coming by, uh, right? There are a lot of threat researchers working, right, for Palo Alto who is creating, working on creating signatures for new new applications. Right, so the the amount of signatures, the quality of signatures, right, that is basically telling you which is firewall is better, right? The more number of signatures, more uh, appropriate or more best matching signatures for an application gives you better app identification functionalities, resulting in right more accurate results, more secure posture, right? So in Palo Alto, right. I'm talking about a physical model here right now, right? I'll talk about VM towards the end, right? So in a physical model, if you take, right, for the app ID, 
right from the uh, standard models right that means from pa 30 20 and above right models uh, 220 and all does not have it why because it's a small scale uh, device from uh, right mid variant to higher variant right you have in the palo alto uh, box you have a hardware right this is nothing but the asic i told you right a dedicated chip that is there on the firewall right this is used for app id so this chip is programmed to do layer 7 inspection of every packet and find and identify the application right so this app id this uh, we call it as the app id engine right it's nothing but a um, electronic chip an ic right programmed to do a signature based uh, so it contains a database of signatures right that palo alto is um, offering right without license you cannot get these right so the app id signatures are there in the um asic so when you power on the firewall once the auto commit and all is done the um, firewall is programming this chip right with all of these signatures now what happens is whenever a packet is coming right the packet goes to this chip to identify what type of application it is right so in this step the chip's job is it uses right an algorithm called dfa right it's an open source right pattern matching algorithm right deterministic finite automata right you, you might have heard uh, right in engineering as such so it uses the dfa algorithm to do a pattern based signature match so there is so let's say this is the packet data l7 packet data it looks into right it uh, does a um, reg regular expression based right pattern matching uh, using the dfa and so for signature does it match no okay move on to the next one this one does it match no right next one right basically it checks through the signatures and finds what signature match so let's say right what is a signature right um so this is proprietary this this area of the technology no vendor will disclose right palo alto or fortinet is not going to tell them hey what is your signature for, for http right they will never tell it why because it's proprietary right anybody can create a signature like that and their edge is lost right so generally what do you call as an ht uh, uh, signature as such right it's nothing but right patterns in data so that means let's say if you take an http packet flow you will have something called as a get right a method field will be there right it can be what get post head right multiple methods for http is there so the signature might look for an attribute called method it might you um, use look for an attribute for a request uri right it's a mandatory attribute that is there in the um, http headers it might look for headers like host right so basically it is looking for certain keywords certain patterns in the packet if it has it yeah it is able to class it. okay so the this this pattern is there this pattern is there this pattern is there and there is an http version pattern as well right everything combined together okay so it is matching with the signature for http immediately the palo alto firewall will understand this this packet is uh, part of the application or is using the application http right or also known as web browsing in actual terms right and palo alto calls it http is known as web browsing in palo alto firewall wherever you see web browsing that means http right http is known as the application name is ssl right <coughs> okay so it's nothing but patterns right in the data right that's how a signature is built so palo alto has made a lot of signatures for this right and it uh, has a dedicated chip right uh, which is do going through the patterns and identifying the um, application as such right so when you have a dedicated chip like that the throughput right the rate at which your firewall is able to identify application is high right app we call it as an app id throughput right so when you take the 
fall out of firewall data sheet you will see app id throughput right is let's say 10 gbps that means this chip can identify 10 gbps of data right the application name or application of 10 gbps gb of data per second right so in the more num more throughput numbers if you want you need a physical chip like this whereas in a vm you don't uh, the firewall right the hardware is maintained by you so there is no chip and all right you you give it a lot of ram and lot of cpu so the same functionality is done on the cpu itself right so you see comparatively reduced performance right where this um, dedicated sic is able to give you 10 gbps this might give you 5 gbps of throughput right so when you have a physical model the added advantage is that these kinds of right acceleration chips are there right which helps in different functionalities of the firewall to give you more throughput numbers right so important terms here is right app id engine and the algorithm dfa right so um, you you will see sometimes right when you check the counter right uh, dfa when you see the term dfa just see that this is app id right app identification being done sometimes you see dfa uh, software dfa underscore sw this means uh, it's done on the cpu right it's a vm model right or uh, the app identification is done on software right and dfa hardware right dfa hw right stands for uh, or dfa as such stands for uh, the uh, application identification done on the hardware box as such right so similarly right so you have the app id engine a dedicated chip there similarly another dedicated chip right in higher models you have for ctd content and threat detection right so this chip is programmed to again do a pattern based identification right it has a lot of patterns for viruses malware spyware right all of those malicious files so similar to your antivirus having lot of right uh, uh, signature and right versions uh, your palo alto has a threat team right who is working on creating signatures for all well known vulnerabilities right all malicious files as such right so it the Palo Alto maintains right uh, if you have a threat prevention license it, it will download all of these signature database right and periodically you get updates for both application and threat signatures right uh, weekly one once or twice you get these right dynamic updates right and just when on if you have a license you can download and install it automatically right so this is again right layer 7 signatures that is there right it is looking for these these patterns and data right if i see this keyword this data pattern right by this um, bytes in this position this is an attack this is a wanna cry right uh, ransomware or this is uh, a cryptic file or this is um, right some kind of uh, backdoor right and that is trying to being uh, transmitted through inside a pdf right so there are signatures for all well known viruses malware files right that is offered so this tip it's again doing a pattern based application uh, uh, threat identification it uses proprietary algorithm called p scan right so the palo alto scan right is what it stands for so the p scan algorithm is used to do a pattern based threat identification of the uh, packets to identify if it if the packet contains a threat if it contains a threat it will block or deny right De depending on whatever is the action that you as an administrator have configured right it might allow it if you have set an allow rule if you, it might block it if you have set a block rule right so the rule is important there right what type of uh, setting you have there so basically right so uh, there is a, a hardware chip that is used to give you good so this uh, having this chip gives you what ctd throughput or threat identification throughput right would be high when you have a dedicated chip like this right high amount of data can be sent through the threat identification engine at a given point whereas in a vm everything is done on the cpu itself right so you you see lower numbers compared to this dedicated chips always right so when you want lot of capacity and all hardware modules or hardware models are right uh, preferred or the physical ones um, or the vm ones right 
so each each every vendor has this kind of technology they everybody uses the asic chip right fortinet uses cisco uses everybody uses this kind of chips right to accelerate things and there are there is one more uh, right? this is not a mandatory thing be uh, right this is nowhere mandatory you can do the same functionalities in a pa220 as well which does not have any of these chips it has a uh, right a two separate cpu one for data plane right we will talk about what is data plane and management plane and all right there is cpu core there is ram that's it like no, like your normal right a machine right you it has a little bit of cpu and ram and everything is done on the cpu itself right the same function app id ctd everything can be done it's nothing but programming right you can use uh, ms word in a small right uh, laptop right with very minimum ram right and cpu as well as a supercomputer nothing there right so the same program can work on both right the better uh, um, throughput or better performance would be given with more hardware right or uh, which has more acceleration capability as such all right any questions up to this point okay all right fine so don't worry about the session i i know that this initial right session right feels a little boring why because it's uh, involving a lot of theory as such but right this is a, a basic right uh, we we need this basic to move on right uh, when we actually start up it will be right fully lab oriented don't worry right the whiteboard is just to get you an idea about the physical stuff right okay now um so uh, that's about the app id and the ctd engine right and the same can work without a dedicated engine right now one more engine i just want to talk about is the app id and so this is the app id this is the ctd and there is one thing more this is also optional right we call it as network processor right or sometimes known as offload processor right every vendor uses this right every vendor in the market uses something for offloading this is a generic term in networking offloading hardware offloading hardware acceleration or um, uh, traffic offloading every vendor right uses this kind of uh, device module right or a chip in, inside all physical models it is nothing but an asic chip again right to have to handle some traffic right so what type of traffic right so the network processor handles every packet comes through network processor and then it goes to different different components so inside palo alto right we the network processor job right is to handle those packets which does not need layer 7 inspection right so every vendor does this right wherever there is no l7 inspection uh, needed there is no point in sending the packets to the app id or ctd engine and no layer 7 deep packet inspection is not needed so it can just do an l4 right um, rule check and allow it that means it will just check okay this ip this destination port this right port number uh, right protocol okay allow or deny right based on security it does not look into any kind of application thread part right you, you we call it as right session offloading can you can you tell me why would give me an example of some traffic which would be offloaded right give me a practical example of any traffic that do you think would would be offloaded think logically and say right why would a firewall offload some traffic just to ease the cpu and memories uh that is true definitely that is one of the advanced use cases that that comes into offloading right uh, so when i tell you that right uh, that was the second part i wanted to pitch on to so offloading would basically uh, remove the high impact on the other right uh, parts of the um, firewall so it would give a breather to the uh, uh, firewall memory cpu all of that right definitely yes 
so so there are some corner cases where some applications right if you have worked in the palo alto industry you might know it some we call it as a high data plane scenario right common with all vendors right every vendor has this that means your firewall data plane or the the cpu part which handles the packet flow right all the incoming packet right incoming and outgoing packets of the firewall whichever is uh, whichever cpu is handling it it's very high right what happens when your system is running on peak cpu 100% cpu you see that it's lagging right or right when you're on a zoom call your cpu is high right your your audio gets jittery right or applications does not work correctly you click 10th right 10 times something works same thing when the data plane is high it results in packet latency packet drops right um uh, right performance issues all of that so um high data plane is an undesirable scenario and sometimes some certain applications can cause the dp to be choked up and then uh, such cases right we might do session offloading right uh, as an administrative method to ease the load on the data plane yeah that that is definitely an advanced use case but give me an example of a common real life practical example which to you uh, which you think right would be uh, logical to do what type of traffic would you offload we need security right we have bought we have spent so much money to buy a firewall to make sure that all of our traffic is inspected why then why would we tell the firewall not to inspect some traffic what type of scenario would would be uh, that a three way handshake true to i mean three way handshake is not offloaded as such i told you right in the three way handshake uh, it is not going into these uh, um uh, engines because there is no l7 data at all right so uh, no l7 data i'm i'm talking about a scenario where there is l7 data but we are not doing any kind of l7 inspection data is there but no inspection there three way handshake is no data so no inspection whereas uh the scenario is there is l7 data you could have done l7 inspection but you're not doing it data within the inside zone um okay so uh, what what is trying to say is that right traffic between your org right between two different internal yes. network as such right yeah. uh, that is trusted right and so you could do it but 99.99 never done why because i told you right insider threat is important you can now most of the attacks are coming from inside an infected machine can cause right an attack so not typically done no right uh, the it's now is the days of zero trust don't trust anything right that is what the motto is right away think of more practical scenario what what is the general internet traffic is everything in, uh, um, uh, encrypted or not or is it plain text the video data right pawn is saying video data no it still goes through inspection right rt voip video rtcp right your uh, ucas uh, your daily performance everything right goes through uh, firewall it, it, it does that right now let me give you an example here right so you have a firewall right and you have a firewall you have somebody um let's say using uh let's say let's say netflix right um, or or non use netflix uh, it will send the wrong expectation let's say i'm using uh, facebook right for example right? this is just a fictitious use case i'm saying and i have a user who is accessing facebook okay what type of traffic would i be using to connect to facebook https correct right so basically ssl encrypted http so nothing but https or http secure right that means you have http which is encrypted using ssl right so all that after the three way handshake all data packets are what you will see if you take a wireshark capture you will see what as application data everything is shown as application data 
right what does that mean it's all encrypted right so you connecting to facebook by default can the firewall see what the data is inside you're downloading or you're watching a video on facebook can the firewall know what it is if it does not uh, decrypt uh, so by default it will not uh, see what's happening true right so there is a decryption use case they're coming in so unless and until you decrypt ssl sessions you cannot your firewall is does not have visibility inside that packets so you accessing you are downloading a file from dropbox unless you are de decrypting this traffic or doing ssl inspection on this traffic your firewall does not have visibility right so these encrypted packets right let's say there is no ssl inspection in this firewall i have not configured ssl inspection by default it is not there you have to configure it which we will be doing a lab as well right so when facebook right i'm i'm trying to download some data some data is coming from facebook right uh, i'm watching a video or downloading a file let's say so when the firewall sees it it's all encrypted right is there any right a benefit of sending this encrypted file to this app id and ctd engine no why do you say so because it's already encrypted so mm -hmm. it will not have like a visibility for app id to determine what's the data is if it's encrypted at by default we are not decrypting true right so right that's the key point here so unless and until the firewall has visibility right it can see the decrypted plain text data right and unless and until it is able to see it it cannot right give any result for app id and ctd right app id will identify that it is ssl that's it right nothing more than that. after that there is no advancement there is nothing more than it can go for right so it will see ssl sometimes you will see it as facebook base as well right that's that's a max it will see right facebook base that is all you can see right for it sir so yeah now i have a follow up question for this mm -hmm. one mm -hmm. as we know for ssl there are like a private keys and public keys shared between client to host right mm -hmm. from the client to the web server and all the hashing algorithms are uh, Uh, agreed between client and server in all the in encryption like md5 so if we can configure firewall in the middle of a, at the edge point between web server and the client which is in our inside zone how does firewall will encrypt if it does not have a private key i mean what's the uh, will, <laughs> will, will be, no no i can just explain that in one one sentence we have a dedicated session on ssl decryption where we will talk on the technology part alone first and then do the lab understood right understood. so we'll be taking this up on a different day don't worry this is a common question that i i come across right this is something that you need to understand right uh, i mean common thing right uh, ssl is very secure we tell you talk about certificates all day then how is the uh, right uh, firewall acting right and and able to see it right to answer in one word it is mitm man in the middle right it's an mi team and how, how does it work we'll we'll take it on a different day all right okay so right so any kind of encrypted ssl traffic right there is no point in doing l7 inspection it's a waste of cpu cycles so all vendors does this palo alto also does this the palo alto firewall is intelligent enough that it will send right n number of packets there is no fixed number it can be 5 10 15 16 more than that so there is it, it depends right so there is no fixed number after n number of packets right the fire for ssl session also the same approach goes it will go to the app id ctd app id will say it's ssl right ctd no no threat nothing it's able to find after multiple packets after let's say 10 packets the firewall understand that this is an encrypted packet and there is no u right use of sending this to these engines it's a waste of cpu cycle so the firewall will decide that i'm um, i will offload the session that means it will add right in the network processor right it will tell it will the data plane will inform the np right it will tell that hey i want to offload the session so it will add a flag 
that flag is known as cut through right it will say that hey i want the sessions to cut through directly that means it's just telling the network processor that hey this packet this sessions right it will say that the session 389 right, or 388 right is offloaded that means any packets of the sessions 